For 2022, Subaru's popular compact crossover gets a makeover and a more rugged off-road capable trim. This is the 2022 Forester Wilderness. The Forester Wilderness is designed for the Subaru shopper that wants to take their vehicle a little further off the beaten path, but not quite as far off the beaten path as you could take a Wrangler or a Bronco. This is filling the middle ground where we don't really have too many good options in the United States right now. You could logically consider this a direct competitor to the Jeep Cherokee and perhaps a RAV4 TRD. Let me put it this way, if you're the kind of person that likes to rock crawl on weekends, you're probably going to want a Bronco or a Wrangler. But if you're the kind of person that wants to rock climb or kayak or canoe or any of those kind of outdoor activities, and you want to get a little bit further down the trailhead, a little bit closer to your destination, that's exactly where this comes in. Every Forester gets a reworked front end for 2022. The most off-road and rugged looking one is of course going to be found on the Wilderness model. All versions have full LED headlights with incandescent turn signals, which did surprise me a bit. LED fog lights below in this very distinctive hexagon shape just for the Wilderness trim. Versus the rest of the lineup, the Wilderness gets a slightly more rugged looking front bumper. Things like the tow hooks are called out right there on the bumper itself. We have sort of what looks like a skid plate here. This is just a plastic painted piece right here, but under the vehicle, you do have the option of dealer installed skid plates that are designed by Subaru. There's a little bit of underbody protection standard. The rest of the protection panels are going to be optional. Size-wise, the Forester is mid-pack in the compact crossover category at 182.7 inches long. This is 9 inches shorter than the Subaru Outback and has a shorter wheelbase. So even though this doesn't have quite the same kind of ground clearance that we find in the Outback Wilderness, this is probably going to go some places that the Outback Wilderness cannot. Interestingly enough, the Outback Wilderness and the Forester Wilderness are not really far off in price. So I have to say, I'm going to be really interested to see which ends up selling more. This is going to be a little bit less expensive, so it's going to be a little bit more attainable, but the Outback Wilderness is going to give you a turbocharged engine. Changes to the rear end design are a little bit more subtle. We have a black ring around the rear window with the same sort of texturing that we find on all the black accent pieces around the vehicle. Similar texturing going on down here at the bottom of the bumper, well integrated parking sensors, and a single exhaust tip over there on that side. Now let's talk about what separates the wilderness from the non-wilderness trim of Forester. The first thing is ground clearance. We get 9.2 inches versus 8.7, which is already pretty good. We also get the fender flares that we see on this model. They're a little bit more exaggerated. Orange accent points all the way around the vehicle and of course the wilderness badge. You'll notice that ground clearance is not quite as high as in the Outback Wilderness at 9.5 inches. That likely has to do with some production constraints by Subaru in their factory. But due to the fact that the Forester is an important 9 inches shorter and has a shorter wheelbase than the Outback, you'll likely find that there's not much difference when it comes to off-road capability. For the roof rack, we get an upgraded roof rack versus the regular model. Orange accents again there, and this is rated for 800 pounds, so you can now put a three-person roof tent on your Forester. In addition to the fender flares, we have unique wheels and unique tires on all Wilderness models. These are the same basic Yokohama Geolander design that we find on the Outback Wilderness. The important thing to remember is that in terms of off-road capability, the tire has a huge impact on any off-road vehicle. This particular tire perfectly describes the mission of the Forester Wilderness, because this is not an ultra-aggressive all-terrain tire. It is technically an all-terrain tire, but you'll notice by the tread pattern that this is also very on-road focused. This is really trying to sit on the fence between on-road driving dynamics and weekend adventure. And Subaru gives us a full-size spare tire with the exact same tire, matching rim, and a tire pressure monitoring sensor. Wilderness also brings us some mechanical changes under the hood, but importantly, we don't get extra power like we find in the Outback Wilderness. So this is the same 2.5 liter 4-cylinder boxer engine we find in the regular Forester, producing the same 182 horsepower and 176 pound-feet of torque. All-wheel drive is standard on all Forester models, as it is on almost every Subaru out there, as is a continuously variable automatic transmission. But for the wilderness treatment, we get a different CVT than we find in the regular Forester. This one has been borrowed out of the Outback Wilderness and the Subaru Ascent. That gives us a larger ratio spread and, more importantly, a lower starting gear ratio. That gives this 25% more torque from a standstill for those stickier situations where you're trying to climb up a grade or climb over a rock or a log. Fuel economy, as a result, likely falls below the regular Forester. This is 26 MPG, but I don't know exactly what the regular Forester is going to get. Expect it to be at least one mile per gallon better than this. Thanks to the new transmission with its lower gear ratios, towing capacity goes from 1,500 pounds up to 3,000 pounds, which is an awful lot closer to the most direct competitor to this, which would be the Jeep Cherokee. Subaru's Active Driver Assistance Tech gets an update for 2022 as well. They call this the EyeSight 4 system because it is still based on a stereo camera setup. There are two cameras right here behind the windshield, but they now have double the field of view that they had before. This gives you adaptive cruise control, autonomous emergency braking, pedestrian detection, lane keeping assistance, etc. The chart on the side of your screen is for the base model. If you get the wilderness trim, then we do get a few more active safety technologies standard. 
So far, I've spent several hours in the Outback Wilderness, and I found the driver's seat to be very comfortable. This is a multi-way power adjustable design. The seat bottom cushion adjusts for tilt as well as height. We have a two-way adjustable lumbar support and a manual tilt telescopic steering column with a large range of motion. But you should know that the front passenger seat is a manual design in this trim. Combined legroom in this generation Forester is very generous. With the front seat adjusted for me at six feet tall, I have about six or seven inches of legroom left. So if you're looking for a more rugged vehicle that can easily accommodate a rear-facing child seat behind an adult up front, this is going to be an excellent option. There is significantly more legroom in here than we find in the RAV4. The RAV4 is really quite tight in the back, and it doesn't improve if you get the more off-road capable versions. I think in terms of real-world accommodations, this is also a bit more generous than the Jeep Cherokee, just due to the shape of the interior. If you're looking for a more reclined driving position or a more sedan-like driving position, you want to take a look at the Outback, because the Outback really is, at its heart, a Subaru Legacy wagon. Whereas this is a bit boxier and a bit more upright, so the seating back here is a bit more traditional SUV. SUV. With this front seat moved all the way back in its tracks, I still have about three inches of legroom left, and headroom is quite generous. I have about an inch left, even though we have this large moonroof. Rear seat passengers get a fold down padded center armrest. The rear seats recline about three inches. There's a little bit of webbing right down here. You pull to activate the recline mechanism, but on the downside, the center seat belt comes out of the ceiling. And that's not my preference because you have to put it away if you want to fold the seats down and put large cargo in here. And of course, it does create a bulge in the ceiling, which is a little bit less cargo practical. Behind the power hatch, we find 26.9 cubic feet of cargo space that is a little bit below the segment leaders. And that's quite logical, because Subaru decided to give us a little bit more legroom combined on the inside than we find in, for instance, a RAV4. And we have that boxer engine design up front, which is not quite as space efficient, resulting in a slightly smaller cargo area. But you can still fit a decent number of 24-inch roller bags back here. I'm just going to pop the score that the Forester got last time right on your screen. But if you're looking for a little bit more room behind the second row seats, there are going to be a few better options in the United States right now. If you fold down the second row of seats, however, things become pretty similar to the segment leaders. Going in for a closer look, we have power buttons to release the second row seats easily from the back, some cargo hooks on each side, and new for 2022, some cargo hooks right up here on the ceiling. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that this trim is placed somewhere between the limited trim and the touring trim in terms of its feature set. We have a pretty large moonroof right here over the driver and front passenger's heads. It extends to just past the driver and front passenger seats, but it's not quite as large as some of the panoramic moonroofs that you find in the competition, and that's why the shade is manual, although you do have to reach back pretty far in order to grab it. We have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger, the Wilderness logo on the front seat headrests. We have Subaru Wilderness accents all around the interior, along with the gold stitching to match the exterior gold accents. These little tags kind of remind me of closed tags. You'll find them on all four doors and on the two front seat backs. The upholstery is one of Subaru's imitation leather products. It's been embossed with sort of a dimpled design. The hexagon theme sort of mirrors the fog lights up front, and it kind of reminds me a little bit of golf ball texture. Let me know what you think about this down there in the comment section below. It's a subtle two-tone design on the seats, so your eyes are not deceiving you. Some parts of this are a little bit darker than others. Moderate bolstering on the front seat back cushion and seat bottom cushion. These seats are heated, but they're not ventilated. The trim panels on the doors have a very similar dimple pattern to the upholstery on the seats. Lots of soft touch materials are going on on the front and rear doors. This upper section is a soft touch material, and then we find upholstery very similar to the seat upholstery for the majority of the door panel right there with the stitching, gold stitching accents, soft touch armrest, and then harder plastics at the bottom of the door in order to improve durability. Moving over to the dashboard, we find a soft touch injection molded upper section of the dashboard, again, with very similar dimples there, more gold stitching, some metallic effect trim right there, hard plastics right here around the glove compartment. It's a nice big bin style glove compartment. I was able to fit a larger tablet computer inside. In the middle of the dash, we find one of Subaru's familiar two screen setups where we have a larger infotainment screen right here that supports Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Tons of physical buttons below that. The system is snappy and easy to use, but I have to say I was a little bit surprised that Subaru didn't graft their larger 11 inch system that we find in the Outback, the Legacy, and the new WRX. Instead, we get basically the same setup that we had before. Now above that, we have a separate screen. The smaller display is controlled via the info button on the steering wheel that you'll see in a bit. It gives us the status of the active safety systems, all-wheel drive system, some auxiliary gauges there, weather pulled from the navigation system, turn-by-turn -turn directions, Apple CarPlay readouts. We have some trip computer information, an analog clock, a digital clock, and the status of the dual-zone automatic climate control. Over on the driver's side, we find a two-dial analog instrument cluster with a color multifunction display in the middle. There's a Subaru Wilderness logo right over there on the tachometer. The steering wheel is basically the same as the rest of the Forester lineup, but we get a gold accent right down there on the middle spoke. 
The info button that controls that multifunction display above the infotainment system, that's over here on this side, along with some infotainment buttons right there, dedicated phone hang up and pickup buttons. We then have this toggle right here that cycles through the information delivered by that multifunction display between the speedometer and tachometer. Over here, we have the adaptive cruise control controls, the aggressive lane centering button, and these are drive mode selectors. Subaru splits some of their active safety buttons. On the left side of the steering wheel, we find blind spot monitoring, enable, disable, the traction and stability control, auto start, stop, enable, disable. And for some reason, the rear emergency button, the lane departure warning button, and the telematics buttons are right up here next to the moonroof controls. Going back to the center console, we find the engine start, stop button, the controls for the dual zone automatic climate control, two USB inputs right down there along with a 12 volt power port, this storage cubby seems a little bit small to me because you can't really keep a larger smartphone in there. We have a pretty traditional console shifter here. There is basically a manual mode down here. We put it to drive, pull it over for the manual mode. You can then use the paddles on the back of the steering wheel to shift gears. This does not toggle the gears around. We then have a dual X mode control here. The X mode system is tweaked for the wilderness trim. It will now stay engaged over 25 miles an hour. So we have a snow dirt mode, deep snow and mud mode or normal mode right there. This is a button for the dual camera setup. Interestingly, if the vehicle is in reverse, the rear camera is on the infotainment system. And if I press the button, then we get a front camera view on the other screen. That screen is a little bit small and far away from the driver. So if I zoom out, you can see that that image does appear pretty small, but obviously you're also looking out the front. That just gives you a slightly different view of what you might be hitting that you can't see over the hood. We then have the electric parking brake, auto brake hold, heated seat controls, two large cup holders, soft touch armrest, and a moderately sized center storage area. Fortunately, I was able to spend a great deal of time out on some of the Bureau of Land Management land out here in Oregon, and this is the exact kind of place that the Forester Wilderness was designed for. Because a lot of the roads out here aren't well maintained, and if you were in something like a regular RAV4 or a CRV or a Mazda CX-5, you would definitely be scraping a lot on some of these roads. But with over nine inches of ground clearance, we don't have to worry too much about the portions of this trail that are a little bit more rutted than others. Now, this is not the most aggressive off-road trail. This really is more of a dirt unmaintained road. And logically, if you wanna take things to the next level, that's why you might want a Jeep Cherokee Trailhawk, or you might wanna take a look at a Jeep Wrangler, something along those lines. Jeep's Cherokee is logically a very direct competitor to the Forester, but this is more of a competitor to the mid-level versions of the Cherokee in terms of off-road capability. If you wanna take things to the next level, Jeep does offer you a two-speed transfer case and a locking rear differential in the Cherokee, but remember that those features are gonna cost you more, they're gonna add weight to the vehicle, so it's gonna reduce the on-road driving performance. It's also gonna be a point of unreliability. And as I said before, Subaru's mission with the Forester Wilderness was really to try and straddle the fence between on-road driving dynamics and off-road driving dynamics. So this is going to be a little bit firmer than some of the more off-road oriented competition out on a washboard gravel road like the one that I'm on here, but it's going to retain the daily driving dynamics that you might want for your favorite winding mountain road on your way to work. This is exactly the kind of vehicle that's designed, honestly, for my demographic. I live off the beaten path, I live down a road like the one that I'm on right here, but I also drive on a winding mountain road that's paved to get to the office every day. So for me, this probably would be a perfect blend of feature functionality. You're not gonna get that next level in off-road ability that you'd get with a true locking differential, a true locking transfer case, two-speed transfer case, etc. but you get a lot of improved capability. And you'll definitely notice a difference between the regular Forester and this Forester off the line. That's because we get that new continuously variable automatic transmission with a more aggressive final drive ratio and wider ratio speed spread that gives you more oomph from a stop. Some owners have complained that Outbacks and Foresters with the naturally aspirated engine don't have enough low end torque or there's something with the CVT that doesn't give them the rock crawling ability or the more rugged off-road ability that they're interested in. And a lot of that simply has to do with the gear ratios. CVTs like the ones that we find in the rest of the Forester lineup are a little bit more tuned to on-road driving and highway fuel efficiency and that means that their final drive ratio and their effective gear ratio from basically a stop is not as aggressive as the one that we find in this model. That's not only going to pay dividends for off-roading ability and tricky weather ability, but also for towing. That's why the tow rating goes up and zero to 60 acceleration. This should be the fastest version of the Forester. Some folks may be disappointed that Subaru didn't put the turbocharged engine under the hood, but that was mainly done to help keep costs low. This is again, less expensive than the Outback. And if they put the turbocharged engine in the Forester wilderness, it probably would have been the same price as the Outback wilderness. 
As always, if you want final drive scores, you're going to have to wait until I can get one of these back at home to do my final testing on, but expect this to be about one to two tenths of a second faster than the regular Forester. The ride quality is pretty decent with these all-terrain tires on it, but this is going to be a little bit firmer feeling than the Outback. So if you're looking for something a bit more supple out on road surfaces like this, you might want to lean towards the Outback. If on the other hand, again, you're looking for something that's perhaps a little bit more dynamic once you're on the road, then you might want to take a look at this. But even with this suspension tune, the Forester Wilderness does a good job of helping smooth out some of these bumps at higher speeds out on this washboard road. Now, the Geolander all-terrain tires are, again, a bit of a balance when it comes to tire design. So these are not going to be as aggressive in muddy situations or rock crawling situations as, say, a Wrangler tire that you'd find on a Bronco or a Jeep Wrangler. On the other hand, this tire should give you more puncture resistance and more mud traction ability than the tires you'd find on the standard Forester models. And then, of course, there's the fact that Subaru chose this tire for the wilderness from the factory. So everything about the vehicle's driving dynamics were definitely tuned with this particular tire in mind. And it's a really good balance once I get out here on the pavement. It's smooth, it's relatively quiet. Wind noise and cabin noise is well controlled, but you might find a little bit more tire noise if you choose the model with these all-terrain tires. Fuel economy is a little bit tricky to talk about because I haven't been driving this at home, but I suspect the EPA estimate of 26 miles per gallon is going to be easily achievable. We do have auto start stop, but no mild hybrid technology on board. As we see with the Outback Wilderness, you should expect the Forester Wilderness to get a few MPG below the regular versions of the Forester, mainly because of the different CVT and the different final drive ratios. At least for the moment, bottom lining the Forester Wilderness is pretty easy. I think Subaru has done an excellent job tweaking the existing Forester to make it more appealing to people that want to go a little bit further off the beaten path. The combination of the tweaked all-wheel drive system, the different CVT, the lower final drive ratio, and the more aggressive all-terrain tires definitely make this more capable than the regular Forester, but also a very rational companion for your daily commute, because even when you're out on winding roads like this, it has a good feel. And if you take things to the next level, there are going to be a lot more on-road compromises. If you take a look at a Cherokee Trailhawk, there's definitely compromise going on there for the added weight, the added complexity, and the added fuel economy loss for all of those various components. And then if you want to go beyond the Cherokee and you want to go to something like a Bronco or a Jeep Wrangler, there are going to be even more trade-offs when it comes to fuel economy, on-road driving dynamics, cabin quietness, practicality, etc not to mention cost. This is going to be a lot less expensive than pretty much anything out there that's going to be more off-road capable. If you want to get your hands on the new Forester, reach out to your Subaru dealer today because these are going to be on sale in the U.S. in December of 2021. And you should probably get your name on a list right now if you want to get one anytime soon. Thanks to the ongoing global chip shortage, supplies are probably going to be pretty thin on the ground, at least for the first calendar year. The base model is quite simply one of the best small crossover deals in the U.S. It's going to start at $25,195 plus, of course, tax, title, license, and destination. The big thing about that base model is... As with every Subaru other than the BRZ, all-wheel drive is standard, and a lot of the competition, that's going to add about $2,000 to the price tag. Fuel economy is also excellent. Most of the competition will have fuel economy very similar to the base model of Forester, but they're going to be two-wheel drive, not all-wheel drive. And by the time you've added all-wheel drive, most of them are going to be a little bit less efficient than the Subaru. So if you're looking for a relatively inexpensive, capable crossover with a low sticker price, standard all-wheel drive, and a ton of driver assistance tech, that's going to be the base model Forester. But if you want a Forester that's going to go a little further off the beaten path, you're going to want the Wilderness trim that we've been taking a look at today, and that will start at $32,820. Subaru has placed the Wilderness model between the two-ring trim and the limited trim in their lineup. The two-ring is the most expensive. That is $35,295 for that model. And of course, if you want the extra oomph that you'll find in the Outback Wilderness, that's going to be a few thousand dollars more expensive than this model. To be perfectly honest, I suspect a lot of folks out there are going to be pretty conflicted between the Forester Wilderness and the Outback Wilderness, because there are certainly pros and cons to either of these vehicles. The Outback Wilderness is going to be a little bit more comfortable. It's a little bit softer tuned out on the road. It feels a little bit more grown up. And of course, it has a lot more power thanks to that standard turbocharged engine in the Wilderness trim. Off-road capability is honestly going to be relatively similar. The Outback has more torque, it has more power, so it's going to be able to climb steeper hills, it's going to be able to get out of stickier situations a little bit more easily than this, but ground clearance is pretty similar. The extra three-tenths of an inch is probably not going to make much of a difference for the average person because the wheelbase is longer in the Outback, the whole vehicle is longer, and that's going to mean that off-roading capability is honestly going to be very, very similar. But this is going to be a little bit less expensive. Be sure and let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below, and stay tuned because hopefully I'll be able to get my hands on one of these for a full weekly video sometime soon, so be sure and stay tuned for that. In the meantime, 
I think it's absolutely not possible to go wrong by ordering a Forester Wilderness or just the regular version of the Forester. By the time you've worked your way on up to the Touring model, I do think that some of the competition may be a little bit better value, but in the mid-level trims, the Wilderness trim, and especially the base trim, hands down, the Forester is quite simply one of the best values if you're looking for all-wheel drive. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below. Check out my video on the Outback Wilderness. That is, again, going to be right on the dealer lot next to this, and I'll see all of you next week.